So hi, Mike Rob Hunter here, Oliver here, and uh, today I think this is going to be the first time that I'm actually going to do a book review. A book review. I uh, bought myself a book and I got it uh, on Amazon Kindle, and you will be surprised by the title. The title of the book is called Microbe Hunters. It's a 1926 book, uh, but it is still published, and I got myself uh, here the Kindle version, uh, but you can also get the paper version. And uh, I already knew for many years that this book existed but I actually never bothered to reading it or ordering it because I said well a book from 1926 it's kind of a little bit outdated already well big mistake big mistake uh, I got a recommendation of uh, from one of my viewers of this uh, YouTube channel and then I immediately uh, bought the book and I have to tell you the following uh, and it's no exaggeration if I say this to you it's my favorite science book now um, really I was uh, totally um, I'm totally surprised uh, by the book. I really liked uh, reading it and it uh, pushed my up to this point my most favorite book up to this point was this book here how microbes rule the world power unseen how microbes rule the world world this was up to this point my favorite book i'm going to make a separate uh, book review um, of this year also uh, but uh, right now i have to admit this 1926 book uh, really um, I, i'm totally fascinated by it and uh, so i decided uh, that i'm going to talk a little bit about this book and i'm i've also prepared <laughs> yeah you gotta bear with me a whole bunch of uh, quotes uh, from the book uh, that I considered quite uh, quite interesting. Um, so, what is this uh, book um, about? Uh, the book uh, uh, is about the so-called the golden age of microbiology. And this is not a term that the author used, um, but the golden age. This was in the 19th century when big discoveries were made uh, in the field of uh, microbiology. And this book, uh, of course, uh, also talks a lot about microscopy because that was at that time a very important uh, tool uh, to characterize and to observe uh, microorganisms. So it is a book uh, also a lot about uh, the use of microscopes. Now um, it uh, basically tells the story of uh, several early uh, microbiologists uh, who were uh, discovering important um, yeah, aspects uh, of the microscopic world, um, especially of course, but not limited to, but especially of course also uh, relating to diseases and, and medicine. Um, but not only, I have to admit. So it covers un among other uh, people, for example, Louis Pasteur um, also, for example, Robert Koch, uh, quite uh, in, at the beginning already, of course, Anthony van Leeuwenhoek, who was the first person to actually uh, um, observe uh, microorganisms. And then also about the discovery of, of uh, that, uh, for example, mosquitoes uh, uh, carry malaria. Um, and all of these things, uh, all of these uh, things are, are talked about in the book. Um, and uh, in, it's written in such a way that it is very understandable. And also, and that is really something that I liked a lot. Um, the author really explains very well the logical reasoning and the science behind it, why the people, the scientists at that time did what they did. And one of the things that kind of surprised me, it's not a surprise really, it was to be expected, but I mean, they were, for example, doing a lot of animal experiments. But then sometimes animal experiments didn't work. Uh, so yes, they also did self experiments. So where they were actually testing things also on humans. I know that for ethical standards, this would not be acceptable these days, but they were also actually testing the things on themselves sometimes. It's quite, uh, quite fascinating. And what I want to do now is I want to just uh, go through a couple of uh, points that um, I kind of liked to hear, so I made myself again a little cheat sheet here um, in the book. Um, but if you want to read a little bit uh, some chapters yourself, please go to Amazon and click uh, on the book, and uh, it is possible to read some uh, chapters um, online as well. But what did I like? Uh, a couple of things that I liked, uh, for example, author's opinions. The author actually not only uh, told the story of those early microbiologists and microscopists, but also uh, mentioned his own opinion um, about that it actually got him also a little bit in trouble with some of those because some people were still living when he published this book in 1926 so he actually had some lawsuits going on even um, but I just want to read this uh, out too because I considered uh, some of his opinions are uh, quite interesting um, he also gives that's the second thing that I like is he also gives credit uh, to the co-workers and to the team um, of the scientists um, among other things for example even the wives uh, um, of the scientists to help them and I think uh, the author does a, a very good uh, just does some very good storytelling so the the book actually does not read like a dry science book but more like a 
a, a, a storybook really and it is the story about those people so and uh, I want to now simply quote a little bit here um, what I mean with uh, when the author actually uh, talks about he gives his own opinions and I found two interesting quotes that kind of yeah, resonated with me and that's why I want to share it with you okay so um, two quotes um, and the first one is, is about that there was some kind of a um, yeah, fight going on between two researchers who should get the credit um, for discovery and uh, in, it, it, the author now mentions the following but why will such searches scuffle when there are so many things left to find you would think of course it would be so in a novel that they could have ignored each other or could have said the facts of science are greater than the little men who find those facts and then have gone on searching and saving so I, I like this a lot. Here the author kind of criticized a little bit that the people made an important discovery, but then essentially there was kind of an infighting going on uh, about the credits, uh, who, who was the first one to discover it. Yeah, and the author kind of criticized this a little bit. Why did they not just continue the research? But then later on, uh, the author also said something um, in, a, in a different part of the book. It was about the, the scientist Spellanzani. Spellanzani and these naturalists of Geneva were bound by mysterious cement, a realization that the work of finding facts and fitting facts together to build the high cathedral of science is greater than any single finder of facts or mason of facts. They were the first haters of war, the first citizens of the world, the first genuine internationalists. Yeah, so that, that's kind of the, uh, the thing that I like in this book, that uh, the author yeah, also gives his own uh, comments uh, uh, yeah, to various uh, aspects uh, of, of the stories. Yeah, and then uh, essentially um, there are a couple of things that I learned um, as well. Uh, something that um, I kind of realized uh, while reading uh, this book. Um, and uh, that is one of the things that uh, is, is that at that time, uh, the experiments that many of these scientists did, they were quite simple experiments. But in their simplicity, they were very powerful because people could understand them. I'm going to just give you a, in a short uh, minute or so an example of this. Um, and uh, this kind of uh, resonated with me because nowadays science has become so complicated and complex that it's very difficult. Uh, I mean, I'm a trained scientist, I'm a trained microbiologist, uh, but it's very difficult for me actually to uh, tell other people about what I did during my thesis research. Uh, it's already so specific uh, and sometimes so advanced that other people have a problem following this. But at that time, um, I, one of the reasons I I think why those uh, scientists were also so successful and also so honored is, is because uh, yeah many people could actually understand uh, the, the experiments and uh, that's why they, they were quite powerful yeah um, uh, something else that I realized is that wow well, they were some of those uh, folks were really workaholics and they were extremely desperate to find a cure even to the extent that they did uh, self experiments yeah, they did not give up. Uh, that's the third point that I realized. Um, yeah, they had so many setbacks. Uh, some some of them uh, failures. It didn't work. For example, Paul Ehrlich, uh, when he tried to discover a cure uh, against syphilis, which is a bacterial um, dis disease, um, he and his team um, they had tried 605 different, had to synthesize 605 different chemical substances, and it, it didn't work. They tested all of them um, on, on animals. It didn't work. But the 606th substance actually worked I mean you have to imagine this type of dedication yeah, yeah and also um, one of the things that I uh, realized is, is and this is a little bit how science might have been a little bit different maybe at that time than nowadays is um, there were some critics um, who simply criticized the theories that the microscopists and the biologists came up with um, and they were just uh, sitting back in the armchair you just were making claims which were maybe sometimes even unjustified and then the scientists they started out and they had to come up with experiments to debunk that nowadays it's like this that if you come up with a scientific claim um, then it's up to you to come up with the evidence but at that time um, sometimes I got the impression that uh, the people who actually uh, made the claims didn't even provide the evidence they just made a claim and then all of a sudden the scientists and the microscopists they had to devise their own experiments now to debunk that um, yeah so I want to actually uh, go a little bit here and I want to read this out to you um, because at that time there was uh, they discovered all of a sudden they saw under the microscope that those little uh, animalcules, the little uh, single-celled organisms, they reproduced by dividing. I mean we all know that, right? 
But for, uh, for those uh, folks in the 19th century, wow, that's something new. They don't mate like the higher animals do, you know, they divide. Yeah, that's what they observed, but there were critics to that, okay? And uh, uh, so Sue, he was one of those microscopists who observed that the cells are dividing. And uh, there was a, another guy called Ellis, and he criticized that. And I'm going to read this out to you now. An Englishman man named Ellis wrote a paper saying the Saussure's observations about the little animals splitting into two was all wrong. Ellis admitted that the little beasts might occasionally break into two. But that, cried Ellis, doesn't mean that they're multiplying. It simply means, he said, that one little animal swimming swiftly along in the water bangs into another one amidships. He just crashes into another one and breaks in half. So in other words, he said, well, of course they're splitting, but not because they're multiplying, they're breaking in half because they bump against each other. That's all there is to the Sassuus fine theory. So that's why, that's what I'm saying, okay? They actually don't divide uh, and multiply and reproduce this way. They just bump against each other um, and that's why they split. Okay, and then you have to come up with an experiment uh, to debunk that. And that's actually what he did. And I, I, find, I find the experiment uh, amazing, honestly. Rot, thought Spellanzani. All this stuff smelled very fishy to him, but how to show it wasn't true and how to show that animal kills multiplied by breaking in two? All I have to do, he meditated, is to get one little beast off by itself, away from every other one where nothing whatever can bump into it, and then just sit and watch through the microscope to see if it breaks into two. Isn't this easy? All you gotta do is to debunk the theories is you just gotta isolate one of them and then you just gonna watch it and if it divides into two then you have basically falsified or proven um, the, the statement wrong that they break apart because they crash into each other, okay? Get one of them and observe it. But that was a difficult thing, how are you gonna get one of them? Okay, and the, the experiment was really marvelous, okay? Then this Spellanzani, this fellow who revealed in gaudy celebrations and vast enthusiastic lecturings this hero of the crowd, this Magnificio, crawled away from all of his triumphs and pleasures to do the one of the cleverest and most marvelously ingenious pieces of patient work in his hectic life. He did no less a thing than to invent a sure method of getting one animalcule, a few twenty-five thousandths of an inch long, a living animalcule off by itself. He went to his laboratory and he carefully put a drop of seed soup, uh, which basically contains uh, the microorganisms. He put a drop of the seed soup swarming with animalcules in a clean piece of crystal glass. That's basically nowadays we would use a microscope glass slide. Then with a, cl a clean fine tube, he put a drop of pure distilled water that had no single little animal in it on the same glass, close to the drop that swarmed with microbes. Now I shall trap one, he muttered. As he trained his lens on the drop that held the little animals, he took a fine Dean needle, he struck it carefully into the drop of microbe soup and then made a little canal with it across the empty to the empty water drop. So he connected the two drops, the one with the micro microorganisms and the one without, he connected them by drawing a little, uh, making a little canal um, with a fine needle. And then he waited until one of them swam across and then using a brush he simply separated and uh, uh, separated uh, uh, the canal off so that he couldn't swim back. And this is the way that he isolated one single microorganism. And this is how he could actually observe one of them and he could see that this one actually started to divide on its own. And so he has basically proven the theory or the, the speculation wrong uh, that they break into two by bumping against each other because it was all alone, it couldn't bump into any uh, other microorganism. I think this is a marvelous uh, experiment. It's, I think it's really... And uh, basically the book uh, uh, goes on uh, like this uh, and uh, um, there are um, yeah, a lot of uh, these uh, stories and uh, descriptions of the uh, method um, that the scientists used at that time. Um, but there is um, the one thing that I really, <laughs> I have to, uh, I know I'm reading a lot today, but there's one thing that I really ha uh, have to share with you uh, because it's so uh, current, it's so current somehow. It's about malaria. 
uh, Batista Grassi, he was uh, he discovered that uh, the a mosquito, the Anopheles mosquito, which was called in Italy, it was called Tanzarone. Um, this uh, mosquito carried malaria. Okay, and he discovered this, but the people didn't know. So I'm going to read this uh, to you now um, as as a last quote here. What is more, Battista Grassi was a practical man, and as I've said, an excessively patriotic man. He wanted to see his discovery to do well by Italy, for he loved his Italy faithfully and violently. The discovery that uh, mosquitoes, um, or this one mosquito, actually carries malaria, that was his discovery. His experiments were no sooner finished, the last good strong nail was no sooner driven into the house of his case against the Anopheles, that's the mosquito, then he began telling people and writing in newspapers and preaching. You might almost say he went about bellowing till he bored everyone. Keep away the Tanzarone, in, in a few years Italy will be free of malaria. He became a fanatic on the best ways to kill the Anopheles. He was indignant, the man had no sense of humor, because townspeople insisted on strolling through their streets in the dusk. How can you be so foolish as to walk in the twilight? Grassi asked them. That is the very time when the malaria mosquito is waiting for you. He was the very type of a silly sanitarian. Don't go out in the warm evenings, he told everyone, unless you wear heavy cotton gloves and veils. So there was a good deal of sniggering at this professor who had become a violent missionary against the Tzatzarone. Folks, I don't know, uh, this was written in 1926. I'm just saying. <laughs> Uh, still very, uh, very current, uh, I, I would say. Well, um, I have to admit one thing. Uh, this book is really uh, worth a reading. Um, it might not be, uh, the writing style might not be to everyone's taste. It is a 1926, 1920s writing style. Um, there has been some criticism in the book because um, the writing style yeah, sometimes can be considered a little bit racist uh, in the use of language. Uh, it's not, I think, not deliberately racist, but the la use of language uh, we, one would not use uh, these days anymore. Um, that was a common criticism, and uh, as a matter of fact, the publisher even uh, wrote a, a note at the beginning of the book. Okay, but that is uh, a, um, also a well-known criticism. I think really worth a reading um, if uh, if you're interested in microscopy and in the early times uh, of uh, microbiology. Um, yeah, uh, leave your comments uh, below. Um, Maybe some of you have already read it. Uh, maybe you have uh, different uh, views of the book and maybe you like different parts. I, for myself, have to admit, uh, I think I'm definitely going to read it again. And I would actually say that um, I, I kind of, yeah, I would make this a mandatory reading for uh, people who study some field in the biosciences. I, I really believe that um, because it really shows the, uh, the, the logical and the logics behind uh, what the people used in actually designing experiments and the controls that they included. You won't believe how many controls they included. You thought, you think that they have already made their case with the experiment that they have proven it. They were not satisfied. They double checked it, made another control, okay? Unbelievable, unbelievable. I think enough for today. Happy microbe hunting as always and see you around next time. Bye-bye.